Once again, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and children of our ladies, you are now tuned into the Investor Show. As always, this is your gracious host, the Prince of Investing, Prince Dice, coming to you guys and girls live all the way for the first time ever, Detroit, Michigan. So, y'all seen this guest before here on my show. Uh, one of my mentors, I read his first book. I haven't got a chance to read the second book yet, but he is uh, here live with us at his hotel. We're right here on the Detroit Riverwalk, you know, right here, beautiful day out. So of course he want to come outside here of his one of his hotels that's downtown on the Riverwalk. So we're here at the Riverwalk's Urban Resort. But without further ado, let me introduce my guest, Mr. Michael B. Roberts. How are you doing today, sir? Very nice, thank you. Glad to be here. Glad you're here. Are you glad? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's been a couple of years, right? It has. It's been a couple of years. The last time it was down in uh, Miami. Yes. Right. 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 So now we've made it around into Detroit, Michigan. Yeah. Detroit for my first ever time. Um, went out to the, you know, I saw the Motown Museum, the MGMs, and you know, a lot of couple of the sites. Yes. Even went up to Birmingham and things like that. Oh, good. Okay. So now I want to ask you this question. Looking at this, coming out of this crazy 2020, right, right, and this ever-changing world, right. So when you look at the world that you've done into real estate, right, we're here at the your hotel. How has COVID impacted your hotel and the hotel business itself? I think it's a great question, and and, and what to start with, of course. The uh, let, let me back up to determine for the audience why a hotel and why in Detroit, for example. When I'm from St. Louis, and although I've owned hotels mostly always in the South and the Midwest, uh, I bought this hotel in 2010, right before the city was uh, going into bankruptcy. Uh, the, the previous mayor was going to jail and the auto industry was in a major downturn so statistically and strategically, I looked at Detroit with these eyes. Basically, I said, I don't believe that America is going to let one of its primarily largest cities go to seed. Uh, therefore, let me invest uh, what is more affordable for me to invest in a major city like Detroit. Uh, now, 11 years later, Detroit has seen a tremendous renaissance uh it was it's been new businesses are starting up more tech related businesses the automobile industry is is booming mm -hmm. uh and then in 2020 when COVID 19 came along uh it affected all of us uh it affected the growth of the city it affected the growth of america for all practical purposes we were shut down mm -hmm. and so in the hotel industry, when you have things like restaurants and bars that are uh, mandated to close, uh, and you have a hotel where there's nobody traveling, uh, I had to consider how to pivot. Uh, as an entrepreneur, one who has you know been engaged in a number of businesses, and, you know, fighting through the 08 recession and, uh, and so many more, uh, I just decided, well. I'm going to, you know, shore up my asset. I'm going to make sure that the property is is where the men needed tremendous increases in in uh, capital improvements. Mm -hmm. uh, I did that. Uh, I got involved with what's called, what's called the PACE program. Uh, so I was able to put just under five million dollars of investment back into the hotel, mm -hmm. so that all of this was. And really, a lot of this is ready to go when 2020 hit. But uh, I continued with that mindset to uh, continue to improve the property, uh, use some of the resources that government was beginning to provide for entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they had the PPP money, you are aware of that. Uh, they had other low interest loans that are available. So, you know, we had to move strategically within those parameters and use those resources. Uh, I continue to research all the grants, all the, all the uh, available funds that are available to us as business people who are 
virtually out of business or all practical pro not having any business i should say mm -hmm. and uh and survived through that so now uh as it's beginning to turn around i think that by 2022 uh, with people you could we can see it now people are really busting out <laughs> they're mm -hmm. trying to travel they're trying to get around they're trying to do things and so i believe that the hospitality industry will experience an a, a interesting boom uh, within the next 24 months. Mm. Okay. Now, one thing I wanted to hit on, right, and it's something that I've kind of, maybe I'm off, you know, I need way more experience than I do, right, mm -hmm. than I have alive. So um, the difference between small business and big business, that's one of the things that I've seen in your stories, right? Where usually we will see, you know, of course, I went down seven mile down there in Detroit, here in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And you see a lot of us that says, hey, I have some money mm -hmm. and we may go get we may go lease a place and start a small business. How is it that you buy multiple buildings? You know, you, right yeah. here, this property, 108 rooms. Right. And, you know, you're talking about the Victor Roberts building down in St. Louis and mm -hmm. it goes on. Yeah. What makes it different from somebody doing small business to big business? Well, a small business is really a microcosm reflecting the big business. Mm. So if you approach it where there's a more of a, a mindset to suggest there's no limits on what you can do, mm. then generally there's no limits on what you can do. Uh, I said this the other day in, in a speech that if you... If you look at something that you've always seen, but you look at it differently, mm -hmm. then the very same thing can have a different outcome. Mm. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, definitely. So what happens then is in business, if we are concerned and considering, you know, what's happening uh, uh, with the economy, uh, sometimes those difficult moments, if you will, can be some of the most opportunistic moments for entrepreneurs, mm. uh, especially those of us who are in the African American community where we don't have a lot of uh, uh, breaks or we don't have a lot of information as to where the deals are and things of that nature. Uh, by us being able to to move strategically mm -hmm. and sometimes politically have conversations with people who are in the know in a given city, mm. uh, that's when you begin to identify your opportunities. So if you have more than one opportunity and you can find ways to finance those opportunities, then mm -hmm. take them on. Uh, you've got to, of course, build a infrastructure within your company to support it. You know, good accounting, uh, back, what we call back of the office type support. Now, one of the challenges that most of us are facing now as we come out of the 2020 uh, uh, scenario is finding employees prepared to work. Mm. Uh, we've, we've seen so many folks who have been receiving uh, government assistance and continue to, uh, and sometimes making more money or receiving more money and mm. doing nothing than working. Mm. So I think what, what we have to look at in the economy moving into 2022 is, you know, are we going to be able to uh, find the types of employees at the labor rate that one needs to exist as a business person and, uh, and then bring them in and train them and keep them interested because mm -hmm. a lot of folks have fallen asleep for a whole year. Now, I have to ask you this question. I'm glad you brought that about the wages in unemployment and people are not working right so when i ask you this question do you believe we have a labor shortage or do you think that it's a pay issue that like, hey the wages are so low that some people don't like to uh you know that people say hey i would rather stay at home so you you think it's a wage maybe wages are too low or do you think labor it really is a labor shortage because i seen out you know uh, out in denver i saw a sign with mcdonald's was you know, starting at eighteen dollars, I thought that was ridiculous, right? So, do you believe it's just that? Hey, why do we have this labor shortage? Is that the people are receiving unemployment, 
you know, you especially been in hospitality. Yes. That was the major hit industry. Now right. you're coming back out of it. Right. You're very relied upon having those type of workers. Well, there's no question. Uh, I mean, those people haven't gone anywhere. They're not. It's not a labor shortage. It's an attitude shortage. Mm. It's 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 a lack of mindset to to have people to to you know get away from you know receiving free money from the government uh, and choosing to work and and build a uh, some type of, uh, uh, of a, both a reputation as well as an income that can support their family. Uh, I think that it's been sort of a low to sleep type attitude that's going to have a rude awakening mm -hmm. as these government subsidies dry up. Uh, we're going to see it in, in housing. I own a couple of city blocks in downtown St. Louis where I've converted uh, old warehouse and office buildings into residential. And, uh, you know, I've seen some people falling behind in their rents. Uh, mm. Then you had the moratorium, so landlords couldn't evict. Mm. Well, that moratorium is going to be lifted at some point soon. Uh, and there will be people who who not have a place to live. Uh, and then they're going to have to go to work. Because mm. if the government subsidy drops, they are behind in their rents, and landlords make the decision that we have to find somebody willing to pay. Because after all, the landlords, you know, people want to make them bad guys, but the reality is the utility bills continue to, to mount up and grow. Real estate taxes continue to hit. Uh, the debt service has to be addressed. All of these things have to be addressed for, for people who have these properties that are being rented out. And so, you know, it, it becomes a, a very difficult, almost a catch-22. Mm -hmm. uh, either you're going to come to work and pay for what for your lifestyle, or you're not gonna have a lifestyle. I'm gonna ask you this might be a little bit of a tough question, right? Scenario. Let's say right now to well, not you today. Let's say you know back in the '80s, right? We're not gonna adjust for you know just keep the same money. So if you had a hundred thousand dollars cash, and you're looking to create wealth. How would Mr. Michael V. Roberts invest? Or what would he do with that hundred thousand uh, dollars? I started with what I could manage comfortably, and that would be real estate and real estate. Um, you know, really taking older houses and mm -hmm. and, rid of, and flipping and, and and or renting them out, building up a uh, a portfolio, uh, but also a a financial statement that could be utilized for bigger projects. So once you get your now, financial now, statement up, you can- I want to pause you there for a second. When you say building up a financial statement yes. that could be utilized, what yes. do you mean? Showing your net worth, in other words, beginning to uh, establish a position that says, I own uh, 100 units of, of, of residential. Now they may be in the hood and they may not be pulling <laughs> a lot, but you can, you can represent that there's a certain uh, value to those properties. Mm -hmm. And you can uh, create that value and translate that into your financial statement. So therefore, your financial statement is is grows a, a great deal. Uh, and let me make sure I'm walking with you there. Mm -hmm. And you want to use it as leverage. Do you use leverage as well to say, hey, I have a hundred grand. I purchase. You borrow against that, right? Am I following you on that? Not necessarily. I would use a hundred grand first on my own. Uh, I would use that and say I could. Uh, buy uh, 10 properties at $10,000 a, a parcel. And now, uh, after doing some fast renovations uh, and, and getting a tenant in, it's suddenly worth um, $30,000 versus 10. Mm. So now I'm showing a, a valuation of a, a personal value of about $300,000, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. You see? So, so then you can maybe double that again, and before you know it, you know you you're at a half a million dollars on paper. Uh, now, while you're doing that, you're also looking at other uh, strategic opportunities that may be coming along, such as in my case, uh, identifying the, the convergence of from, from uh, of the digital environment as a futurist. You know, I always would look down the road to determine well, what's coming up 
where will people be spending money and how will they be spending it and what type of currency will they be using so if you begin to look at in the future all of these uh, changes that are taking place, if we could even discuss that for now, for example, um, there, there's huge amounts of, of growth uh, that will be available for entrepreneurs. Uh, and at the same time, there'll be a lot of jobs that will be lost in the traditional sense. For example, any job that is task-oriented, meaning it's repetitive, uh, by 2025, 2030, I would say, over 50% of those jobs will be gone and replaced by uh, a robotic digital environment. And so, and that's in the whole country. Uh, so now what we're gonna see is half of the people who work on, in task-oriented jobs won't have jobs. So they already have to begin to look at strategically where to go next in terms of uh, uh, being able to create a job and for us entrepreneurs, we, we're looking at well, where are those businesses going to be uh, in, in the future. And we start to move in the direction of positioning ourselves uh, to, uh, to inherit it. Uh, there are many examples of businesses uh, I wrote about in, in my second book, actually, is the season 2.0, the second volume, uh, where we show that, that robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, and machine learning is all a part of the future. Uh, but it's now. I mean, there's nano chips uh, that are so tiny that they'll go into your body and be able to help assess your health conditions. We're going to also see, in, in short order, uh, 3D printing that will actually create organs. They're building houses with 3D printing. 3D printing, where they literally, a house is built with, with robotic 3D printing uh, capability. Uh, you know, a human generally dies because one of their organs goes bad. Uh, and so what will happen is, if, if we can replace that organ, you can live longer. So now if you're living longer, then it's going to be a different type of business opportunity. Other kinds of senior living. Uh, that won't just stop at 80 or 90, but it'll be going to 100, 120. Uh, and then all of the environments around that, uh, all the support systems around uh, longer life of humans will exist. Uh, literally one day you'll be able to look in your mirror where you'll have all these nano chips that can look back at you and analyze you. And you can literally say, mirror, mirror on the wall, what's wrong with me? <laughs> and the mirror will then diagnose you and 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 will send your data to the robo doc the robo doctor will then evaluate what that evaluation is send a prescription to the robo pharmacist the robo pharmacist will then pull the necessary drugs that will be needed for you call up the robo uh, transport drone system which will come pick it up and deliver it to your house uh, and that is not that far away. Mm. I got to answer this question. Knowing this is kind of you speaking about biotechnology, mm -hmm. right? Yes. How does the actioneer position himself to benefit from biotechnology? Well, well, what you would do is establish first an understanding of what is biotechnology. Right. And then you begin to look at what will be the surrounding uh, businesses to support that. Uh, there's going to be a need for the manufacturing of certain uh, components, of, of, whether it's the uh, chips that's going to be needed in order to uh, make it function correctly or the necessary tools. And all the manufacturing of everything that's going to take place that's needed for all of that to operate. All of those little pieces, each and every one of those little pieces are business opportunities. So let me give you an example. This is going to stretch your, your thinking for your audience for a moment. Let's assume we're sitting at a dining table and we look at a fork. And we say, okay, well, what did it take to create this fork? Well, somebody had to mine the metal. Somebody had to first own the mining, 
facility that all the equipment that was necessary to mine that metal had to be invented and established. It had to be transported to that mine and it, then it had to have humans to, to actually handle most of the work or someday it would be robotics. So once that metal is taken, then it goes to a place where the actual fork is manufactured. Well, A, somebody had to transport that metal to that location. That location where the fork is being manufactured had to have manufacturing equipment to manufacture it. The metals necessary to make that metal equipment had to be mined somewhere and they had to be over road travel in order to get it here. Then you had to have the equivalent of a designer who designed the fork in the first place. And then you had to have somebody who approved that and a, and a whole staff that looked at it and said, ah, this is the type of fork we should produce. And then that fork is then produced. I'm skipping a lot of things mm -hmm. here. But that fork is then produced in all types of ways with all types of employees. Ultimately, that fork needed to be packaged. So somebody had to come up with a designing component to package the fork that was going to be sent to you. And then somebody had to package it physically, get it set up, and then somebody had to market it to sell it to you in the first place, because otherwise, how would you know about that fork if you own the restaurant? So somehow it got to you, and then there's a whole ecosystem. Yeah. You follow me? Mm -hmm. And so every step of everything has an ecosystem, and there's an orbit that you have to recognize. And when you see that, you fit, find out, well, where could you fit in that orbit? And that orbit then ultimately gets that fork unwrapped and to your restaurant and sitting on the table in front of you. Mm -hmm. I mean, so so if you think of everything that way, and that's how an entrepreneur, like, you know, eh, if you're going to be a true actionaire, you have to think that in big, big, big ways. And then you have to say, okay, here's my niche. Here's what I can, here's where I fit in. Here's where somebody else fits in. And then try to develop it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I always I like talk that. about people who go fishing, and you think, okay, okay, I have a rod and reel, but that, but somebody had to design that hook, and manufacture that hook, and somebody and and get all that to me. Somebody had to manufacture the line, that filament that had to be developed, and established, and woven, and brought to a location where I bought it. The reel had to be designed, and even the screws inside of the reel had to be established someplace and brought in, and then assembled and all of that. And then you had the pole itself that had to be manufactured, and the components in the pole. There'll be two more. There'll be two more, yeah. Uh, that's when these, uh, we have these great, wonderful uh, transit ships that pass here. They end up anywhere in the world. Uh, mm. So it's an interesting place here in, in Michigan. At any rate, long story short, and I think you get the picture. Uh, if you so, if you want to get into uh, some type of biotech type business, you have to look at it and you say, well, what is it, and where are all the elements, and how are those things going to fit for me? You see, when I built my wireless uh, cell company, took it public. You know, I realized that that you needed to have towers. You needed to have office buildings, you needed to have equipment, and you had to have different types of equipment. You had to have certain kinds of staff. Well, then you had to start to identify all those pieces and put them together. And then you had to cherry pick out what's going to be the area that will help you make the most money. Now, I think one thing that has changed from you starting out in the 70s, come all the way to 2021. I was born in 84, so you know, uh, I know you got kids my age. Mm -hmm. But the thing about it is, I think one of the things that has changed from your time, your you know your era from when you started to now, is that now we have accessibility to everything. Meaning, uh, we have so much information. We have we live in the information age where it's so much. You know, when you say like yeah. you gave the simple principle of, hey, if I had a hundred thousand dollars, this is how I would go, right? Now today, people come in and say, hey. You know, you don't need a stockbroker. You can go buy a REIT, right? A real estate investment trust, and it'll generate you this much money a month, right? How would you look at buying hard-held real estate assets versus going to get a REIT? Yeah. Well, I would blend my uh, my portfolio. In other words, if you if you invest in a REIT, you're not in any control. 
you're in you're at the mercy of others mm. uh, if you own your property you're at your own mercy so to speak so it's up to you to make a decision as to your appetite and willingness to get involved now you know if I'm working if I'm an executive at a corporation and I have a nice paycheck uh, and I don't have the the time uh, or the interest or the expertise to jump into major real estate then you know yes you know you're, you feel safer putting it in the market or with a re uh, that's understandable um, I would rather control my own investments than to have somebody else control my investments personally mm -hmm. that's me and uh, so you know, I'd rather have my money working for me in a direction that I can control mm. because I'm an entrepreneur. That's what I do. I'm not a uh, passive. I'm not a job holder, so to mm. speak. You see, uh, I'm not knocking it. Because people do very well in some of the jobs, but they are paycheck to paycheck. Mm. Uh, when it's all said and done, because as wealthy as you may feel, you know you're still getting certain checks in, but you're also uh, finding yourself uh, purchasing things and getting uh, into a lifestyle that requires you to be able to sustain. Uh, and if you're going to sustain, you have to have that income. Well, if that's snatched away from you, you know, for example, if I was an executive in the cruise lines and suddenly all my cruise ships just stop mm -hmm. and there's a major layoff at all levels because it was indefinite as to when, you know, they would need my expertise uh, within a cruise line, then I'm, I'm sort of looking for government assistance at that point. Mm. Okay, well, I got to ask you this question, right? When you look at your investments and portfolios, right? You're going into twenty, we're in twenty twenty one right now. And you spoke about it. You've been holding this particular property we own right now for over a decade, you know. And looking at this, the housing market. Is, or just a real estate market in general is just boom, right? As an actioneer, how do you take that? Do you wait for the downturn? Do you jump on it? You take action now? What type of action would you take right now? Do you think the real estate market, well, it's simple with it ask. The 2021, do you believe we had a peak going for a bubble? What do you, how do you feel about real estate? Well, I, I don't think commercial real estate is at a peak. Mm -hmm. I think housing in nice neighborhoods are certainly uh, at a peak and not at a peak but but in a you know growing position if you will mm -hmm. uh, I think that if you if you um, you know if you're clever you have to look at how to pivot for example in the hotel this is a great location I mean it's a wonderful location for uh, to be to convert some of those rooms into residential condos or apartments and if I do that, then maybe I could still keep half the hotel as a hotel. Uh, I have a, a bar, a restaurant, and a conference center. I could take each and every one of those and make those uh, profit centers. So I could convert this into a true mixed-use facility. I also was sitting on just under four acres of land, and I can build two towers with underground parking and then another 280 uh, apartments and, or, and uh, uh, condos. Mm. So, uh, so the asset has uh, a variety of, of, of opportunities if that's something that I choose to take. Or I could sell it and then take those proceeds to my properties in the Bahamas and continue to grow my, my Bahamas properties. And, uh, and mm. that may be a, a more interesting uh, place to invest because it has year-round capabilities. A lot of Americans and people around the world are, are looking at if there's another uh, COVID-19 type scenario, mm -hmm. uh, then people would might say, you know what, if I'm gonna have to stay in a house, mm -hmm. I, I don't wanna do it in uh, upstate New York. I wanna, I, I'm gonna do it at my house in the Bahamas. Um, and I'll just be there for a year and be done with it. Well, speaking of your house in the Bahamas, mm -hmm. The Robert's Castle. I hear you have these amazing New Year's parties, right? Yes. And I never got an invitation to any of these parties. Okay. What's, what's, what's up with that, Mr. Robert? I'm not cool enough to get on the list? Well, 
that's not the case. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, and I'm not saying you're not pretty enough. <laughs> so since she gonna start it, I'm gonna finish it. <laughs> uh, no, but um, it's the eve of New Year's Eve, and uh, mm. yeah, I have people come from all over the, the world really who, who come to it, and it's it's a great networking, and it's a great excuse for people to get out. Quote, to uh, yeah, come, come there, and it works out. But I, um, but my primary development in the Bahamas is Roberts Isle, which is a... Roberts uh, what now? Roberts Isle. It's called. Roberts Isle, okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a part of some property where I've, I've built already um, two buildings that are have 18 units on it and two houses. Mm. And I have another 54 or 56 to build. Uh, but I've stopped building because of the uh, recession and, and mm. then this, of course. But, uh, you know, there's always new resources. Uh, in St. Louis, I have a strip shopping center uh, <clears throat> that was struggling last year, but now, uh, as of uh, now, it's 100% occupied. <clears throat> so uh, I have different investments, some in Columbia, South Carolina, which I have to address now. It's a beautiful office building that used to be where I housed a TV station. Uh, I sold the station, and it's now uh, a building that needs to be I need an adaptable reuse for it. Mm. Uh, so I'm creating a tech center uh, to connect with the HBCU uh, colleges in the area, uh, Benedict College, Allen, uh, South Carolina State, uh, and have it so that uh, our HBCU students can have a place to, to really experience uh, business opportunities in the future. It's going to be tech related. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, for our students who have always had uh, challenges uh, to be relevant, if you will. I mean, you can get a degree in history, but is it better to get a degree in cybersecurity? Mm. Uh, and, and we have to begin to move our students in the HBCUs in that direction of uh, having a, a more of a, a, a high demand field. Yeah, well, yeah, in the future, you know, that's why studying uh, in STEM, you know, science, technology, you know, engineering and math, I mean, these things are real now and, and the future holds wonderful returns for them if they, uh, uh, if they study in those directions. I mean, what I found is when President Obama put me on the National Advisory Council for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, um, many of the larger white colleges had representatives there. It was only 26 of us, but presidents of a MIT and Michigan, University of Michigan and Georgia Tech. Uh, and there was only one other African-American on it. I'm the serial entrepreneur and he, he, was, he was dean of the business school at Howard. But what I saw was that, that all of those schools were creating these, or had created and for a long time had it, these uh, tech facilities and, and training and uh, where kids could go in and experiment uh, in, in futuristic type businesses, uh, research, et cetera. And so what I think we have to do is, is create a hub where our students can come and get exposure to um, to those who are in the tech industry, especially mm -hmm. uh, uh, in corporations who have uh, 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 chief technical officers, CTOs they call them, who can come to a facility and lecture to our students and be able to give them some actual uh, uh, experience and maybe be able to start to create intern programs in the tech fields for um, our HBCU students. Okay. Now, you brought up uh, being put on the council by President Obama. For the audience out there, what was your tie to former President Obama? How did that kind of happen? Well, the, the way I met him was I did a fundraiser when he was running for the Senate, mm -hmm. the United States Senate. I'm in St. Louis. Across the river is East St. Louis in Illinois. He was running for Senator of, of the United States Senator of Illinois. Uh, and uh, my cousins out of Chicago knew him and asked me to have a fundraiser for him, which I did in St. Louis. 
at my hotel in St. Louis. Mm. And from that, we developed a friendship. So when he chose to run for, for uh, president, we also were involved in, in a fundraiser too uh, in, our, in, our, in our town. Mm. Yeah. And that was the start of, mm -hmm. did you know, was he, was president even in the site at the time or he was just senator? In his mind, I'm sure it was. Uh, we were just happy to see a black man get elected to the United States Senate from Illinois. Mm. I mean, that's you know one step at a time. I mean, I'm a former elected official myself. Mm -hmm. You know, when I finished law school, I moved two blocks from the projects where I lived for 10 years and was elected to the St. Louis Board of Aldermen, the city council. And uh, uh, so I've always created this um, orbit of political people wherever I am, whatever businesses, whatever city I go to, you know, I go get to know the mayor and the council and, and other elected officials because I never know when I may need them uh, to assist me in, for example, reassessing my taxes, mm. <laughs> my real estate taxes. Mm. Okay. You know, there's, there's little things like that that people sleep. You know, when you buy some property and you get this huge amount of, suddenly you have unexpected uh, costs like higher taxes. You got to know strategically what you're going to do about that. And strategically what you do is you, you move in politically and you get friends to talk to the assessor and you do what you mm. need to to have those taxes lower. Okay. Now, here in Detroit, obviously you made a huge investment here in Detroit and you believe in Detroit and you spoke about things you can do with this property yes. and things that you would like to do. How do you feel about the current state of Detroit real estate? Is this a place that um, you know, entrepreneurs should come? Is it still undervalued? Things like that. I mean, it's not as bad as it was back in you know 2010. Mm -hmm. But you know, obviously, it brought you here out of St. Louis. How do you feel about the current state? Is it a place you will come and invest in, or is it a place you'll be if you can afford to invest in it now? Because the, the properties and values have shot up. Uh, I used to buy major buildings in downtown St. Louis. I, at one time, I had probably three city blocks. Uh, here, how much could, was it back then buying these blocks or things like that? Well, you bought a, you bought another building. I mean, they were in the millions, but uh, I had taken some companies public and, and mm -hmm. started starting from zero like me to have achieved what I achieved was interesting and extraordinary, I guess. That's all written out in my books, uh, mm -hmm. both of them. Uh, we talk about that. Uh, but to your question, I think... One quick question. Yeah. Was the Sears building, was that your first building? No, that was not my, that was my first commercial building. Yes, okay. but it wasn't the first. When I finished school, I bought a, a house within a month or two out of law school uh, in the in the hood I had to, and I had to renovate it myself uh, my first financing came about where my dad worked at the post office for 39 years right um, and he had some of his buddies there at the postal credit union and I said dad I need seven thousand five hundred dollars uh, so he took me into his buddies and they loaned it to me. $7,500? Well, that's all I needed back then to buy a house. Well, you can buy houses now for a okay. dollar. I mean, you know, in, in some cities, I mean, they just run down. You got to work on build them up. So, uh, uh, but here, here was the cold-blooded side of it. They, uh, <laughs> cold -blooded. they, they loaned me the $7,500, but they told me that the collateral would be my parents' furniture. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm. I'm not sure if that was true or not, but <laughs> one thing I did was I started getting hustling and busy to, uh, you know, to get that paid off because I would hate for them to pull the truck up and take my parents' take furniture, you see. So you know? I'm, I'm, from what I'm getting from you, you feel right now there's opportunities in commercial real estate versus residential. I didn't, no, not versus, in both. Uh, mm. But you have to be very careful in the commercial side of things because... If you're, for example, if you're doing building an office building, um, a lot of people are not coming back into offices. They're, mm. they're uh, you know, staying at home and, and working uh, virtually. Uh, if you're going to get into a big shopping center, you have to be careful because people are buying things online. Mm. Uh, I was the first African American to serve on the International Council of Shopping Centers, uh, which is the worldwide organization for all shopping centers, um, owners, tenants, 
warriors, architects, and all that. And uh, in those 50 years uh, before I came on board, there had never been a person of, of color, so to speak, uh, on the board. And it was extraordinary because you learn so much, you, 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 you find out so many things that's going on uh, in, the, in that world. Uh, but I'm pointing out the fact that, you know, you'll see, you've seen more of the large companies, Sears and, and, mm -hmm. and even Targets and others that have moved out of those big boxes that they were in. Mm -hmm. And now the question is, what are you going to do with those properties? And I think I know, uh, you know, some of the things that I'm off into would be uh, gamification and uh, esports and have competitive uh, have facilities where people can come and fly drones in, inside in a competitive way. Uh, I think esports is something that we have to look at from a business standpoint, because uh, if we look at it carefully, it's already a, a, a billion dollar industry and it's growing mm. with teams competing against each other. Uh, it's a sport. And it's also a sport that you're gonna see at some point in the, in the Caesars of the world, the casinos of the world, uh, where they'll be betting on esports competition, just like they bet on horses or basketball. Uh, in the future, we're going to see much more of that, and we're going to we're going to see more and more uh, of those types of teams competing. In fact, you may even get to esports may end up in the Olympics in okay. the future. Wow. Okay. Now, how do you see you know next? What's you've done so much? You know. Uh, I mean, from you starting out from politics, becoming a lawyer, going into uh, uh, starting off in politics and getting into real estate, then taking companies public, uh, shopping centers, malls, hotels, and towers and theaters, all that across the world. You know, now you know at your age now, or whatever. Uh, what's next for Mr. Michael B. Roberts? Well, I, one thing is, as I always tell people, never retire. Mm. Uh, I jokingly say retiring is is like putting new tires on a car. Retire mm. ring to drive on in the same car. Uh, the uh, it's just a little clever statement, uh, but I always tell people if you're human, uh, you're an animal. You're a Homo sapien. I said, what other animal retires on the face of the earth? I mean, if a lion retired today, he becomes his brother's breakfast tomorrow. So, so the point is. As long as you have, you know, life and energy and you can think, the older you get, the smarter you are, and probably the more you have in assets and, uh, and, and you still dream. So I think that people need to em embrace uh, their future, not in the form of a retirement, sit down doing nothing or only playing golf or something, but to really challenge yourself and to uh, to really identify new and emerging business opportunities. I just described several to you that I'm getting involved with. Uh, I'm getting involved with eSports. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at tech centers and the value of beginning to create uh, and expose more people to these future business opportunities, more speaking engagements. I don't know, maybe there's another book inside of me. There's, there's all types of Listen, I'm pregnant with ideas, pregnant. so you know it's really no big deal for me to to Which speak one? about myself uh, in terms of what are the opportunities. Mm. So to to answer your question, you know the sky's the limit, and I almost like I feel like I'm just getting started. Mm. When you look at all the other things that are happening out here, and you educate yourself as to the, the, the prospects and the opportunities, you really begin to realize that there has been you've done a lot. I've done a lot, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I should stop. Mm. You know, it's to the contrary. It's it's engaging even more, uh, if you will, into uh, the emerging opportunities and leading the way and offering advice and counsel for people who need who need it. Okay. Now, when you look at yourself today, like with all these properties, how do you have the infrastructure? management like what is your style of leadership of you know you got properties in st louis properties in detroit properties in you know all over the country all over the world yeah. right 
how do you manage and you know to know what's going on? Do you how do you find the right people? That's what I would like to say. Well, it's it, it, how do you do it? You 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 uh, you know you put yourself out there. You meet people. And you 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 develop relationships, and then you choose hopefully wisely as you go through it. I mean, I've sold uh, probably ten hotels over, but during that time I had great managers. Um, I had more African-American female managers than any other company wow. in the hotel industry. I mean, nationwide, you don't see as many as I had. I was the largest independent black owner of hotels in the country mm. uh, that I, I owned 100% of and I managed 100%. Uh, same thing with the, uh, the 12 TV stations that I owned, you know, all over the country. Those, those are all properly uh, managed and, and you know just building up a good relationship with leadership within your company so that they can help you uh, and they can help themselves all at the same time uh, there's no do-it-yourself kid frankly Prince to to be able to just doing it you know or having it done you, you, you really literally have to um, constantly be heads up I speak all over the country so I meet people Good people, qualified people, competent people, and uh, and then I try to enlist them into the uh, into the fold, so to speak. Mm. Now I gotta ask this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you know, with all these properties, if you ever have a property that you know you just need to get rid of, you know, you could just give me a call and I'll take that off your hands. You okay, know? good. <laughs> as long as you can write the check. <laughs> Uh, I'll, you can have this one if you if you can, if you can write a big enough check. Yeah, I don't know. I, mean, I ain't got there yet. Maybe one day. Maybe one day. Well, you never know, man. You never know. You, you you know a lot of people. You put together a syndicate. You come up with a plan and and you you execute on it. You know. You should never say that you don't have it. You should always say only say I, I'm going to start working on that. So okay. Whether that's going to be this or something else, you know. I'm going to hold, I'm gonna hold, hold you to that. Yeah. Now. This might be a little, little self-absorbed. We met down in my uh, Miami, mm -hmm. right? I think mm -hmm. we saw him for the first time. What was your first impression of Prince Dax? Did you even have one? Well, Prince, I think you have a, a commitment to educating people. Mm -hmm. uh, I could tell. That's why I said that. Said that with you. Uh, you were persistent uh, to identify me as one of your interviewees and. Uh, I, I saw that you had the characteristics of a person who, who was just, you know, looking at making a contribution where you could, and this was your way of doing it, uh, trying to develop a, uh, at some point, you know, a, a nice audience to hear you because you were, you know, handpicking those that you're interviewing. Mm. Uh, so, you know, how was it that you chose me? What made me choose you? Yes. Well, so I was sitting down and uh, somebody said, hey, you need to talk to Mr. Roberts. I'm like, well, where's Mr. Roberts? Mm -hmm. And they started to give me a quick resume and they give me their phone. It was on Google. It was showing me some I was like, oh, wow. You know, just to see somebody who builds a, I mean, I mean, 100%, I, I never met a black man that owned a, a hotel. You know, you own, you know, like you said, you the largest one in the country. Yeah. So to see that, I mean, it's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. You know, to to see what you did in politics, to see what you did in business, to see what, I mean, just to, I mean, we're sitting here in your property, right? Yeah. In your hotel. You know, uh, yeah, I could have called you on the phone, or maybe we could have done something via video, but I'm always looking to expand my mind, mm -hmm. right? To see things, because they say once you expand your mind, you can never retract it. So now that I see it myself, I want to see, it, it was, it's, it's a no-brainer, like, why wouldn't I want to sit down with Mr. Roberts and to see what he's done from, you're talking about in 2021, you've been doing this since the 70s. You know, you're buying Sears Towers, and, you know, we buy Sears, the buildings and the towers and taking, my dream is to take a wealth management company public. One, mm -hmm. that's it, just one, right? And you've done this numerous times, taking numerous companies public, numerous buildings, and you know you're here with 
waterfront property in Detroit. Always look for, you know, uh, like you said, I, I do handpick, right, of who I talk to, who I sit down with and things like that. And it was just a, a no-brainer to why wouldn't I want to talk to Mr. Robin? That's an inspiration, you know? So uh, that was the thing, you know. Of course, I admire it. You know, well, what inspires you to keep going? To keep and, and doing what you're doing? Uh, well, and what's your end goal? My end goal, well, for the, the platform is, I mean, it's grown. You know, it's grown over time and it's grown over the years. And for itself to just continue to make it grow, right? Maybe one day I may still invest the show, right? But one of the things I want to have is I have two goals on my nonprofit side of the house. I want kids, I think kids should be, uh, when they start school, they should have investment accounts. You know, when they turn 18, we give them scholarships and all these other funds and things like that. Why not kids, you know, when they in the fifth grade or something, not in the fifth grade, at the age of five, when they start kindergarten, why are they born with investment accounts, right? Um, so we could set that up for, like, urban kids, you know, maybe income, maybe it could be income-based. Because how we're set up now is that if you don't have that uncle or mom or dad that sets you up an account, you just don't get one, right? So... Um, the price of school and education is going up, so that's one one thing about nonprofit side of the house. On the other side of the house, wealth management. Um, you know, I was I can't think of the company name. It's downtown St. Louis. It's C I D F E L. Is it Stiefel Nicholas? Yeah, Stiefel. You know, the bear and the bull in the front. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, like, you know, yeah, even though the country's a friend of mine, That's a friend of yours. But I saw that, right? I was just in St. Louis probably like a month or two ago. Mm -hmm. See how he took that company public? Yeah, he has done well with it. Done very well with, you know, assets under management. That's my dream. Mm -hmm. On my for profit side of the house to build something like that. So, uh, sitting sitting down with people like yourself and different people, is I was like, wow, how do they do it? You know, I'm coming from this little small town of Waynesboro, Georgia, and to educate people and show people along the way. Because I'm inspired by, you know, uh, when I got done with school, I was like, man, why nobody told us this? Now, you spoke about, you know, now that you spoke about, I remember mean, reading into your book, to television stations, right? And you won this competitive offer with the FCC. Yes. And you got this license. Now, I'm not very well versed on that topic. Would you mind educating my audience on why was that so important and the competitiveness to get that particular license? Well, let's talk about TV licenses with the Federal Communications Commission, radio licenses, and then broadcast uh, as it relates to, say, the telephone business. All of those I've been involved with, okay. Uh, the TV license back and there was a time when you would apply for the license, uh, and generally once you apply, you may have others who apply for the same license. Uh, so you have to do your engineering, you have to get your consultants, you have to go after this. Uh, but then if you have com competing entities going after the same license, then what you're facing at that point is a hearing, and a variety of hearings where you're trying to the other side is trying to tear you down and you're trying to show their inconsistency, their inaccuracies, and so on and so forth. And then ultimately, the Federal Communication Commission awards a license to someone. And we, that's how we, we ended up with it. Other licenses are being held by people who, will, for example, never built the TV stations. Those are called uh, construction permits, is actually what you receive until you actually go on the air. Then you actually get a license at that point. So we bought uh, several construction permits in different parts of the country where we then built uh, stations. In, in the city where you are now, for example, I have a TV station right there in Denver. Mm. And uh, I owned a, a very nice building uh, right off of Five Points. Uh, oh, yeah. It's, I don't know if Pierre's restaurant is still there, but it's one of the best places for Chicken and catfish, but uh, chicken and catfish. They, they had a great, they had great food there. That's all I can say. Uh, but I owned the building across the street from that, you know, for a long time. Uh, so same thing with the radio station. It's a series of, you know, you can either buy it. For example, uh, you might find somebody that's in bankruptcy, mm. and then you may buy it out of bankruptcy and apply to the FCC so that you, you have to show that you have good character and, and you you don't have a bad history and all that. So therefore, you can 
you know, you're, you're uh, vetted mm. because you still, a license from the FCC is a public trust. So the FCC has to make sure that you are somebody who can be trusted with this uh, license as a public trust. Mm. If you were, when I went after my wireless phone company, I had owned TV stations. I knew that uh, we were beginning to move from an analog signal to a digital signal. Back then, uh, cellular phones were also analog. You know, the old snap, crackle, drop? Mm -hmm. You remember where the coolest person in the theater had a had a phone in a briefcase? And yep. That was them. <laughs> but when I saw the TV stations were moving to digital, I immediately recognized that so would be the cell phone companies. And it would eliminate, ultimately, analog signals. So the FCC, in determining how to issue licenses, had six different levels of licenses for the entire country and all the U.S. protectorates. And those licenses uh, were to be auctioned. So literally, I had to get in the auction to, to, to win licenses. And then I decided that once I received it, I should really connect with and affiliate with one of the major companies. So I did that with Sprint. And uh, long story short, uh, I had to, I made a deal with them to, to, to work with me on my licenses. Uh, I flew a team, um, I, by then I had my own private jets, and I flew a team with me over to Kansas City to meet with them, all my engineers, everybody. And uh, they told me that at that moment that they were not going to issue uh, any types of um, arrangements with companies other than rural telephone companies so that they would become the affiliates. In other words, Sprint was going to build and was building the big cities and the rest of the country in rural areas. They were going to let others build them and then connect their network with them. Uh, well, I had owned half of the state of Missouri, and there were others. And I told them that if you can arrange, if you work with me, then I'll become a Sprint affiliate. They said, we don't do that with entrepreneurs. We're only doing it with rural telephone companies. Uh, well, as I was leaving the door, I said, great, I'll see you in the marketplace. Because, as you know, in the phone company business, it's first to market. Whoever gets there first and gets the customers tends to keep those customers. Well, believe it or not, a month and a half later, they called me and flew in and said, we've changed our mind. We're going to let you become one of our affiliates. And here's a map. You draw what you want. So I took the whole state of Missouri, <laughs> half, half the southern part of Illinois, little Kansas, Arkansas. And uh, I proceeded then to almost double, maybe triple the footprint that I had and utilized their license to build... Uh, footprint so it took about it were initially a hundred million dollars to do it uh, and the um, once I became an affiliate of them and they had this buying power it dropped to about 54 million and the question still became where am I gonna get that from and so I was at one of the affiliate meetings and I asked one of the rural phone companies well how do you guys fund this stuff you know mm. and they said well what we do is we work with the vendors who are going to supply the uh, who who would be supplying the the base stations, antennas, all the back, you know, the equipment, and and provide what's called uh, vendor financing. Well, I had never heard of that, because I'd go to Wall Street to try to get money and tell them I need a hundred million, and they'd laugh so hard I have to they fall out the chair laughing. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd put them back in the chair. Uh, but once we got to this point. There was two primary vendors, uh, three really, Motorola was one, uh, Lucent, and um, and I said, you know, let me see what I could do. Nortel was a big one. They were already in St. Louis and Kansas City and thought that they had a lock on the whole state. The reality is I had the lock. Nortel said they would do financing. But they would do one dollar for one dollar. In other words, I put up a dollar, they put up a dollar. Mm. And I, I didn't have that. Um, so when I talked to Lucent, I said, how would you like to own Sprint's backyard, the state of Missouri? Mm. They went for it. 
and gave me 100% financing, all 54 million bucks. And and they took a stake. They they just were my bank. They were my financing. Then I used loosened equipment. You see, the idea. Why do they do that? Is because if you if you put a loosened equipment in over the years, it's going to have to get repaired. Now those I had to pay that back. That was a loan. But the point is, it was perpetual for their business because mm. whenever something had to be replaced, it would have to be loosened equipment. Mm. So we ended up building it, and that's what we made, and we made it work from that. Wow. Okay. That's deep. That's what I, what you just did. That's all about book. Oh yeah, I, I, I read that about mm. you know getting that tower, and then that to me was big business versus small business that yeah. I was speaking about. Like, yeah. well, who's thinking about getting the tower and getting those type of deals, and then finding the financing? Like you corrected me earlier, say hey, it's not about having the money; it's about working on it. You'll find it, and that's exactly what you did with the towers. So. Yeah, and but, it's not the towers so much as the towers are just sticks in the ground. Mm -hmm. It's the base station and the antennas and the lines. That's where the money is. When we when we took our company in public, we sold the frequency mm. and kept the towers, the steel. That's vertical real estate. So they would rent that back. And then eventually we sold the towers to American Tower Company, the second largest tower company in the country. And we were the second largest independent tower company, 200 towers. So we sold that for about $98 million. Not, it's a little 98 million? Well, the other company went for over 300 million. Oh, okay. okay, just a little 300 million. Okay. Well, I'm glad I was able to get this interview for you, Mr. Roberts. I definitely. It's definitely iconic interview for me to be out here in Detroit at your property. Um, I want to end this to say, what do you have to say uh, for the audience watching um, watching this? It's going to catch this place. What do you have to say to them? Well, I just want people to understand that there's opportunities globally, especially in Africa. Uh, in 2019, I was part of the return of the royals. Uh, where in, in, in 1619 was when the first slaves hit America. 400 years later, in 2019, we're starting to go back, and those of us in the diaspora, recognizing that those are our family, those are our ancestors from there, that we need to consider looking at how do we put ourselves in positions to go into the Ghanas and the Sierra Leones and other countries uh, and, and bring our expertise there and help grow, because they will become the largest country with populations that would be employable in the future. It went from Japan to China to India, Pakistan. The next real hub globally will be Africa. And we from the diaspora need to spend time understanding it, understanding how to do business in the various countries. And there are different concepts in each country. It's not like Africa is a monolith. It's Ghana, you know, it's Nigeria, it's all the various countries that are uh, independent countries with independent political bases. So we have to look at how do we and where should we, you know, if we're interested in the natural minerals, gold, bauxite, silver, uh, platinum, palladium, uh, or if we're looking at just cocoa uh, mm. and the farming side of things, and, and on and on and on. Um, it is pregnant with opportunities and with plenty of people to uh, to be trained ultimately. So hopefully that in the next 400 years, uh, people will be able to look back at some of us and say, wow, they got us started in Africa and, and it was the return of many of us who, who, you know, had took the time to find that we actually have roots there. For example, uh, I come from the Mende tribe out of Sierra Leone. I did a, an analysis of that, uh, a heritage analysis technique. Uh, I was placed as a paramount chief when I went there. And then when I went to Ghana, I was instituted as a king. So you should address me as Nene. Uh, uh, in the future. Uh, All right. Give us the African respect, okay? Okay. And to everybody out there, uh, continue to watch uh, all these interviews that you're providing. I think it's, it's something that is it's extremely valuable and, and rare in many ways. So, uh, Prince, I 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, as you already know, coming live from the beautiful city and state of Detroit, Michigan, at the Roberts River Riverfront Riverwalk, Riverwalk Hotel. Riverwalk Hotel, right here live. And to the next video podcast, cartoon, book, whatever you sell, whatever you see me do crazy around the globe. Peace, be safe. I'm out. Thank you.